students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 5, Earth's Processes. This is video number 11. And we're going to start our last little section in Module 5 and look at fossil formation. In this particular little mini-series, I guess we're going to have a look at a couple of different ways in which fossils form, some of the different examples of fossils that we see, and start to get a little bit of an idea of how we might go about investigating uh, what information fossils can give us about past life. We need to describe the conditions for fossilization. We need to be able to model some processes, and that's one of the things that you'll do in class. And we're going to specifically at the end of this particular video look at mold formation, and we're going to compare that in future videos to things like casts and trace fossils. The big question is, what are fossils? Well, fossils are any evidence of past life. So there's a couple of different forms in which they uh, may be found. And there's a couple of, I guess, generalizations as well that we want to look at, first of all. The first of those is that marine fossils are more common than terrestrial fossils. So a lot of the fossils that we've found have been of organisms that lived in the oceans. Hopefully the reason for that's fairly obvious. Um, in fact, there's probably a couple of reasons why that might be the case, but that, that both of those would be relatively obvious to you. Terrestrial fossils being out in the open, being exposed, a little more difficult for them to actually um, retain some of those conditions that are required for fossilization and, and ones which we'll look at um, as we go forward in this particular video. Hard parts are more commonly fossilized than soft parts. So, um, hard body parts like um, skeletons, bones, uh, exoskeletons, shells. These are the sorts of things that we find a lot, or at least we find evidence of a lot in the fossil record um, in comparison to soft body parts. And this is why um, fauna like Ediacara, for example, was so incredible because they contained uh, whole assemblages of soft-bodied organisms and that's such a rare thing for us to find in the fossil record that when we find a whole lot of them uh, or at least evidence of a, a community of these types of organisms it's really um, a major discovery and one that tells us a whole lot uh, about a particular uh, time period that we didn't know much about and the other thing i guess that also hopefully is fairly obvious to you is that fragments are more often found than entire specimens and again, for, for fairly obvious reasons. Now, part of uh, what we're going to do in this particular video is look at some of the different types of fossils, the conditions for fossilization, and specifically looking at paleontology, because it's a really exciting field of science. Paleontology is the study of fossils or the study of past life. It's actually a, a fantastic kind of um, mystery game where you try and put together from the evidence that you have, from the clues that you get from the fossil record, what was actually going on. Paleontology is such a huge field that we've split it up into a number of different areas like paleobiology. What, what did previous life look like? How did it work? How did it function? What is it most closely related to that's still living today? And can we get clues from the past, about the past, from the present? Paleobiogeography, we've talked about how the the continents have been shuffling around as a result of these plate tectonic super cycles. And so biogeography, paleobiogeography is really important too in trying to get a sense of the distribution of continents and oceans around the world and how that might have impacted on past life. Uh, paleoecology, what were the relationships between different types of organisms in the past? How have they mirrored what we have in the present or do we find different types of relationships, different types of uh, interactions that we see in some of the organisms from the past? And the present is the key to the past. So a lot of what we see now happening is a clue to what might have been going on in the past. When we're looking for fossils, we're looking at, at a range of different types of things. Very rarely we find whole specimens. You may have um, read about some of the discoveries of, uh, say, whole organisms preserved in ice or insects preserved in amber. Certainly, um, if you're a classic Jurassic fan, you'll, um, you'll know that one of the uh, premises, if you like, around Jurassic Park was the extraction of dinosaur DNA from insects that had been preserved in amber. Uh, and certainly, um, in, in a case, I guess, of life imitating art, there was uh, a number of scientists that were looking at the blood 
for mosquitoes that were of the same sort of period to try and sort of see exactly what could be done uh, in terms of that fictional work that Michael Crichton wrote um, that inspired uh, the whole Jurassic Park world uh, movie series. Now, as I mentioned earlier, whole specimens are rare, so more often we find things like casts and moulds. Um, these two things often go together, and I'll talk about moulds later in this um, video, and of course, casts in the next one. Sometimes we get preserved, uh, mineralised hard parts, things like petrified wood, permineralised um, fossils that basically have had um, a very slow um, deposition of different types of minerals that have replaced basically the living tissue. And so now we get um, a tree that's actually made of rock. Um, and so that's a, a, another nice little group of fossils and then trace fossils. So trace fossils are also very important ones and they, they're traces of life. So they're not actually a fossil of the organism itself, but they give us a clue to what types of things were there and maybe some other things that we can look at. So footprints can, can be used to talk about, or at least to determine relative size, uh, relative speed, depending on how close they are together, uh, impact, depending on how deep they are, and coprolites are fossilized dung. So that tells us something about the diet of prehistoric uh, animals. All of these are different types of fossils. There are lots of different things that we can look at uh, when we're going through and having a look at each of these uh, specimens. So why would we study paleontology? Well, there's kind of six key reasons, I guess, that are compelling in terms of why we might um, take some time to examine past life. The first reason is origins. And humans are always interested in their origins. Where do we come from? Um, what was living before us? How did the earth form? How did the universe form? These are often very deep questions and ones that we all tend to think about from time to time, some of us more than others. And so paleontology is one of these areas that can tell us a little bit about what was happening uh, before the present time and going right back into things like the origin of the earth. Some curiosity about past environments as someone who um, grew up enjoying dinosaurs. The whole Jurassic Park thing was was massive for me. I love those series. And a lot of people do. A lot of people get very excited about dinosaurs. Such massive creatures, so different to what we see. And it gives us that curiosity. It gives us that what was going on, what was actually happening uh, in those previous um, times on Earth. As we've looked at recently, we can also link climate and biodiversity. So we know that the way that the plate tectonic super cycle works, it's changed the distribution of continents and oceans around the Earth, and that has had an effect on climate. And likewise, that's also therefore uh, placed certain environmental pressures on um, the ev evolution of organisms. And as a result of that, we've seen um, rises and falls in biodiversity over the geological uh, record and certainly many times over that time. So it gives us an opportunity to start looking at what's the relationship between climate and biodiversity. And of course, that also helps us when we're making predictions about what might be happening to our current climate uh, and what we're doing uh, to the atmosphere and how that might impact on biodiversity of life on Earth as it is now. We can also look at the nature of evolutionary change. There's some interesting fossils in the fossil record that um, tell some quite unusual stories because they represent organisms that are not alive today and they therefore we can't actually go and look at them. We have to infer, we have to try and figure out what's going on, how things are related, how things have changed, what sort of environment might have existed at the time where the owner of these particular fossils was living. Extinction events are also relatively regular events in the fossil record, and we see a number of occasions where both minor and major extinctions happened, um, from small reductions in biodiversity to almost 90% losses in the number of different species, and also the way that species recover after those events. And this can be an interesting um, thing for us to do, um, to try and get to some of the causes, potentially to some of the causes for extinction events, and see if there are things that we can do um, differently now that we are a part of the Earth. And finally, biostratigraphy. So biostratigraphy is basically looking at layers of rock with 
um, living or at least a record of living things in them and how they might relate to one another. So we can start to get an idea of um, similarities in environments. We maybe can use this as evidence for maybe where continents were joined at some point in the past and then separated. So biostratigraphy is another really interesting one and, and was one of the areas of evidence that helped support the idea of continental drift. So then conditions for fossilization. What are the conditions for fossilization? Well, you've got to have pretty much all of these if you're going to create fossils. And so therefore, when we talked about more common in marine environments, uh, more common uh, for uh, whole or, uh, for fragmented organisms rather than whole organisms and more common for hard parts than soft parts. You'll see when we go through this list why that is the case. So the first thing we have to do is we have to have fairly rapid burial and one of the reasons we have uh, we talk about rapid burial is because it actually uh, creates the conditions for some of these other important things on the list. So if we're going to protect our um, potential fossils from biological or environmental disturbances, we don't want them blown all around the place. We don't want scavengers to come and eat them and carry them off um, or break them down completely by crunching them all up into tiny pieces. And we also don't tend to want um, massive destruction from things like fungi that are going to basically take over these particular um, potential fossils. So rapid burial does pretty much all of that. Excludes oxygen, it um, keeps and protects and preserves um, the organism that's that's um, passed on and um, and allows it to be protected from all of these um, other uh, potential sources of attack. We need time. We need to make sure that there's a sufficient amount of time. We don't want the breakdown that occurs to damage the um, potential fossils in any way. So we want that to be a, a nice, slow, gradual process. And sometimes that's going to be a very slow decaying of the soft tissue, leaving that impression behind a mold. Um, sometimes it might be permineralization where we get new minerals coming in and slowly replacing the living um, or the once living tissue and creating uh, things like petrified woods. Those, those sorts of processes are part of that. We also don't want too much metamorphism. We don't want heat and pressure because if that potentially melts that region or squeezes it in some way, then that could destroy any chance um, that we have fossilization occurring. So you can see there's actually a lot of conditions for fossilization and that's one of the reasons why fossils are rare and also why there are uh, the fossil record is dominated by certain types of fossils over others, marine over terrestrial, hard over soft, and um, fragment over whole. So what we're about in this particular one is moulds, and we will have a look at, in class at the difference between moulds and casts. But basically moulds are just 3D impressions of the rock um, that have been left after the original organism has decayed. And so this often happens in things like uh, muds, shales, where you get that soft, uh, very soft sand, soft soil, um, clay mud that's going to basically squeeze in and is going to create a nice little uh, fossil, a nice little impression um, that's left uh, in the mud. And so over time that gets preserved and then afterwards we come back and we can see fantastic detail on something like this, uh, this beautiful little ammonite. Um, that uh, has been basically left as a mold, as an impression. Now, if I was very careful, I might be able to put in something like Plaster of Paris uh, into here to create a cast for myself. So um, some other substance that's actually going to come in, if I can be very careful, squeeze out all the little air bubbles, make sure that I've got complete contact, then I might be able to get a cast which would kind of show this sitting above um, the surface the way that it may have looked in life. In moulds none of the original organism remains and all that we get left with is that um, sometimes beautifully detailed impression that we see in the rock. And as I mentioned sometimes these moulds can later be filled in by other minerals. And in fact one of the ways that they can be filled in is a way of creating casts. And casts are what we're going to talk about in the next video. Thanks for watching.